listening to PetLifeRadio.com. You've had a long day at work, and you can't wait to just get home, take off your shoes, plop yourself down in your favorite chair, and relax. Ah. You walk up to your tranquil residential home and your neatly manicured lawn in your quiet suburban neighborhood, put the key in the lock, open the door, and... Yes, the pets have gone wild! What were you thinking? Welcome to the show about everything you always wanted to know about exotic pets. Where to get them, what to feed them, and how to care for them. You'll even find out why some people live with a monkey. Now, here's your host, exotic pet expert and author, Bob Tart. Hey, Bob, what were you thinking? Hey, Brian. Brian, it's Bob. Bob Tart. Bob, I haven't heard from you in months. I think it's been since last December when I sent you a birthday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Never mind that. Now listen, I'm only calling now because I need a favor. Uh, I'm doing a weekly internet radio show for PetLifeRadio.com about exotic pets. Don't even ask. And I keep asking listeners to email me because I want them to be on as guests. But, you know, no one emails me. I don't have any guests. Well, have you posted any of the shows yet? Well, what does that have to do with it? I've done the shows. They're on my computer. That ought to be good enough. Okay, listen. Here's the skinny. I'm going to call you back and interview you about your volunteer work at the zoo. But listen, do me a favor. Don't let on that we've known each other since kindergarten. I don't want to make it look like I'm so desperate that I can only get my friends to appear on the show. Okay? Uh, by the way, did you like that uh, birthday present? Oh, I, I don't know. I don't know. I think they threw the box away without even opening it. So, okay, you going to do the show or not? Sure. Okay, okay, I'll call you back. Okay. Hi, I'm Bob Tard, author of the books Enslaved by Ducks and Follow Weather, and host of What Were You Thinking? A show about exotic pets. Now, not everybody wants a monkey swinging around their house and smoking their cigars. And although it surprises me, most people don't even want a parrot chewing up their woodwork. Uh, now, I'm on the phone with Mr. Brian O'Malley. Uh, am I pronouncing your name correctly, Mr. O'Malley? Uh, that's right, Mr. Tart. Yes, you are. Okay. Now, Mr. Brian O'Malley, he lives in uh, Vir Virginia City, I, I think. or Arlington, Virginia. Mr. O'Malley lives in Arlington, or Vir Virginia, and um, he doesn't have a pet of his own in the little cardboard hovel in which he lives, but... He does love animals. In fact, Brian loves animals more than any person I've ever, well, I, I have never met Mr. O'Malley, but he satisfies his craving for exotic critters by volunteering at the National Zoo in Washington, D.C. Now, Brian works with monkeys, macaws, and other animals that start with M at the Amazonia exhibit. So, uh, Mr. O'Malley, yeah. how did this happen? Well, it, uh, it goes back uh, probably about 10 years when uh, my son was born, and uh, every day off, I'd take him to the zoo. And over the years, it became a favorite activity, and then my daughter was born a couple years later. It was something we always enjoyed, and during bad weather, Amazonia is the perfect exhibit to go to because it's indoors. They just had a circular there saying, volunteers need it. I called them. They said, well, can you come by and talk? And I uh, went and talked to the volunteer coordinator, and uh, his first question was, well, when can you start? It was a pretty thorough thing. And I said, well, I don't really know anything about exotic animals or really animals at all. I like them, but uh, they said, well, we'll teach you everything you need to know, and they've done a wonderful job. Have you had pets of your own? I've had. I've had now, this isn't a civet cat or a bobcat or a nanny cat or anything. It's, no, it's just a, a... It's a cat. It's an orange cat named Henry. Okay. But but you were still interested in working at the zoo? Um, yeah. I think it, it, the whole operation there fascinated me. And, um, you know, the Amazonia exhibit's really quite spectacular. Do you want me to give you a few of the little factoids? I do it. Do it. Together yeah. for you? Yep. Um, it's the, the largest, most complicated exhibit at the Smithsonian Institution's natural, uh, National Zoo. Okay. It's 15,000 square feet. It's a dome. Inside it can accommodate 50-foot trees, 
and it also has a 55,000 gallon aquarium complex that duplicates the uh, Amazon uh, River. Good grief, that's bigger than the one I used to have. Uh, yeah, that one that uh, 100 gallon. Oh, sh- 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 anyway, the uh, 55,000 gallon tanks are spread out over four uh, different types of systems. So there's the very large sort of pelagic river fish, then there's uh, smaller ones, then there's a much smaller one uh, for piranha, and then there's uh, something called the flooded forest, where they have arowana and stingrays. Cool. Now, what do you work with the fish, with the fishies? Well, it's it's a wonderful uh, program they have there. I get to work with all the animals. So I, um, I've uh, fed the fish, I make lunch for the fish, and... Uh, you, you make know. them lunch. Yeah. What, what do they eat? Well, different fish eat different things. Uh, are you kind of the Emerald Lagasse of the National Zoo? Um, well, actually, there are some volunteers who make very pretty presentations of, uh, of things, but I kind of just throw it together. I thought you had a reputation for really good plating of fish food. Uh, <laughs> well, they actually do have a plate they bring out for the docents to show people what... Uh, what the, the different types of food that the fish eat. Now, do you wear a uniform of some kind when you're doing this? Uh, a T-shirt. This is a pretty basic, uh, pretty basic. Does it say zoo on the National Zoo on the T-shirt? Yes, it's National Zoo volunteer. Wow, I want one. Well, uh, you could come down and volunteer. And oh, that's way too much work. Yeah, it was, and it is a lot of work. You have to have be able to give, uh, you know, a good eight hours uh, at least a week to do. Things because there's an enormous amount, and the Amazonia exhibit is unique at the National Zoo because it relies very heavily on volunteers. Well, give me a rundown on what kinds of animals we're talking about that that you know you interact with. Well, let's see. We've got eight different species of birds in the rainforest, and it and understand it's it's a complete rainforest uh, environment. There's 350 species of plants. There's 40 species of fish. Um, there are uh, a pair of TD monkeys. Um, there's a sloth, and the sloth is, you know, I've worked in at Amazonia for a couple years now, and I've only seen the sloth twice. You've only seen it move, or you've only seen it at all? It, 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 it's it kind of up in the... Remarkably key. like a shrub. Ah. It, you know, and it stays very high up in the tree canopy. And it's very hard to see. So when you saw it, had it come down for a drink of water or something? No, I had actually climbed up. There's some pretty precarious climbs that we have in Amazonia to put food up where the animals are. So we sort of climb up this ladder, and then there's this kind of pulley thing that they raise up, so it's right near the top of the tree canopy, to with a couple trays for the sloth. And you know, I've done that for a couple of years, and I noticed the food's gone, but I seldom have ever had seen the sloth. And then one day, I uh, happened to be up there, and I turned around, and I was kind of face-to-face with him. kind of looked at me and kind of shrugged and kind of moved off. Now, you don't think any of the other zookeepers are maybe climbing up there and um, sampling the sloth food themselves, do you? Um, it would be pretty slim picking. Oh, is that what? What did the sloths eat? Well, they, well, it's kind of vegetables. That you know, there's, uh, and and we we kind of cut this the, the food because he's got very long claws, and so it sort of fits his grip. But um, it's carrots, sweet potatoes. They're all you know obviously raw. Some lettuce. Um, there are things that we uh, call monkey biscuits, which are things that are made. For nutrients for monkeys, but the sloths seem to like them too. And uh, bananas, they like bananas. And you work with monkeys too, yeah. as you were speaking of monkey and biscuits. The monkeys, the monkeys yeah, actually. These are TD monkeys? TD monkeys. And oh, could you describe those? What are they? Well, they're pretty small Amazonian monkeys. Um, 
<laughs> Needless to say, they're kind of cute. And you're right. You're right in the cage or the pen, or, or... Well, there's no cage for them. The whole they just roam all over the dome. Well, when people co come into Amazonia, so are they also roaming in the in the dome? Yes. There's a walkway through the middle. You come up these stairs, and the monkeys will actually kind of watch people. In fact, people, you know, because it's a very authentic jungle environment, it's a little tricky to see the animals. You can't just kind of walk through and expect to see them. You have to take some time and stay still, and suddenly you'll start seeing lots of all the animals. And, of course, um, when I wander through with pans of food for them, uh, you see I many. lots of friends. <laughs> you see all of them. Yeah, I bet you do. Now, are, how many different kinds of animals are all kind of grouped together in one area of Amazonia? I mean, would you have the macaws and some of the other birds in with the monkeys and in with the sloth? Well, they're all in together. There's no separation. So there's no animals that would prey on another animal? In well, there. you have to be careful about that. Sometimes the monkeys will prey on the birds. Oh, they will? Yes. And sometimes the birds will prey on the frogs or the, and the toads. Yeah. I bet the monkeys leave the uh, macaws alone, though. Yeah, the macaw is a pretty tough customer. Uh, you you had a pretty good relationship with uh, one of the macaws, didn't yeah. you? Well, and the macaws is a very interesting. Uh, and, I mean, you know about parrots, Bob. And um, by the way, um, I've read your books; they're fabulous. Oh, thank you, Mr. And O'Malley. Your listeners uh, should uh, buy them both, um, and they're just excellent, entertaining reading. Why, Mr. O'Malley? Well, Mr. Tart, what can I say? <laughs> I I think you're a genius. I have a lot of respect for you. Well, thank you. Uh, anyway, we were talking about Mac the Macaw. Yeah, is this like a blue and gold, or...? Uh, he's blue and red. Okay. And uh, can be pretty grumpy, and uh, we hand-feed him, just like we hand-feed the monkeys, uh, because that enables us to, you know, you take a look and see, you know, if they're okay, if they or feathers are in good shape, or with the monkeys, you know, if their fur is okay, or if they might have injured themselves in running around. Right. Like that. But you say hand feed. I, you know, I have a couple of parrots, and, uh, Stan, uh, not Stanley Sue, I, I used, yeah, I used to feed Stanley Sue by hand, and, uh, Bella also, but, uh, Dusty, uh, these are all African greys I'm talking about, uh, you know, you gotta be kind of careful, and I think I would be hesitant to hand feed a macaw. Well, I was terrified, actually, and the way they teach you to do this is um, that we have sort of a, a tray, and you want to do, it, talking about presentation of food, you want to do the stuff so Max sees the stuff that he likes. So he likes fruits and, uh, and bananas, but there's other things there that he should eat, and so what you do is you kind of... Uh, hold it out at arm's length, and then he will sort of very delicately reach down and uh, pick up the food. And this is out of a bowl or something? Right. And if he wants to, it's, a, it's kind of a flat pan. Almost, it's kind of like if you imagined a, you know, a, a bread pan that was kind of cut off. That, uh, is there bread in it? Well, there's monkey biscuits. They kind of like those, too. Yeah, we had monkey a pair at that. Monkey biscuits yep. uh, seem to be uh, kind of a popular item. Although the monkeys aren't really, in my experience, too fond of them because they've kind of pitched them at me a couple times. And well, who wouldn't? And uh, so you would call them so-called monkey biscuits? Yeah. Although if you leave the tray there, the monkeys eventually get around to eating it. By the way, is how you cut down on the predation problem because they, you know... You keep them stuffed. ...the animals enough that they don't feel the need to go hunting. Okay, anyone who just tuned in, and I'm not sure if you can just tune in to a podcast. I mean, you, you got to pretty willingly and deliberately listen to this thing, right? But can you if go into the middle of them? I don't know, but if anyone, you know, is uh, have a short attention span or something, I'd like to remind them that uh, I'm talking to Brian O'Malley, and he's telling me about volunteering for the Amazonia exhibit at the National Zoo in Washington, D.C., you are listening to What Were You Thinking? And we will be right back after this potentially interesting message from, I don't know if it's from a sponsor. I don't know if I have any sponsors, but um, it'll be a message and then we'll be right back. <laughs> 
What Were You Thinking? We'll be right back after Bob gets the ducks out of his living room. Don't go away. There's nothing like a shaggy dog, baby. They're shagatelic. And this is the place to find out how to have harmony in the household with your pets. Oh, yeah. So stop by our pad every week and get switched on, baby. Switched on to the show that's all about attitude. Oh, behave. With your groovy host, pet edutainer Arden Moore. Yeah, baby, yeah. Every week on demand on PetLifeRadio.com. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Okay, ducks are in the pond, rabbits in his hutch, and monkeys... Oh, in my car! Oh, okay, well, I go check my insurance policy. We'll turn you back over to Bob. Welcome back to What Were You Thinking? I'm Bob Tart, author of the books Enslaved by Ducks and Foul Weather, which I just can't mention enough. And uh, we're talking to Mr. Brian O'Malley, who satisfies his craving for exotic critters by volunteering at the National Zoo in Washington, D.C. And, Brian, you were talking about macaws and about uh, feeding the macaw. And uh, on the break, uh, you were telling me something about uh, poison dart frogs. And right. um, In fact, I do have one last story about uh, the macaw before we go to the poison dart frog. Tell me. And before even that, let me just say, Bob, I really respect the hell out of those books you've read. They're funny and touching, and uh, you know, I recommend it for the whole darn family. Well, thank you, thank right. you. Getting back to Mac the macaw, there's kind of an interesting story. Ed, who is one of the senior keepers at the zoo, and uh, a brilliant man, um, apparently ran afoul of uh, Mac the macaw a few years ago. And uh, they had bonded very closely, and Ed uh, guides the Smithsonian National Zoo trips down to the Amazon. He's very knowledgeable. But he's got a doctorate in biology and all these types of things. And Mac never forgave him for leaving. And uh, you know, so he was gone, I think, for two or three weeks. And I guess it's been 10 or 12 years, and Max remained mad at Ed. And Ed always wears a baseball cap. So the one thing you do, you don't want to do when you feed Mac is go up and wear a baseball cap. Aha, uh-huh. because... Uh, the... Because he thinks you're Ed. Yeah. And, uh, or at least he thinks you're well, enough you like... the pan out of your... <laughs> and so, I, I mean, I've sort of progressed with Mac. I can actually feed him out of my hand. He'll take food right well, that's pretty brave. Well, I sure as hell don't wear that baseball. <laughs> <laughs> but he's a he's just a fascinating animal. He's just amazingly smart. And, and when you walk into the forest, because there's a lot of stuff you have to do, we actually have to water the rainforest. And when you walk in, you always hear this kind of, hello. And if he likes the food you've given him, he'll say apple for you. Oh. This is a pretty interesting animal. That's very good. But yeah, birds are very smart. Yes. We've got ten different species of uh, frogs and toads in Amazonia. Now, you probably know those frogs are getting popular as pets. Right. So to, so tell me a little bit about them. Well, poison dart frogs are so vividly colored because it's a sign to predators that they are incredibly toxic. The, the beautiful blue ones, uh, I think, are called Dendrobates tinctoris. And uh, in the wild, they have enough poison in them to kill 10 people. Now, it's interesting because they don't produce poisons like a snake. They eat bugs that eat poisonous plants. And the biological process is called sequestration. And somehow, that plant toxin that goes into the bugs is somehow separated out by the frog digestive system and turns into a toxin on its skin. Okay, so what do they eat? At, uh, I, I guess my question is, so are they not so poisonous well, at the zoo? they're not poisonous at all in Amazonia. Oh, they are. We don't feed them bugs that eat poisonous plants. And do they still maintain that vivid color? The, the yeah. diet has nothing to do with that? The diet has nothing to do with the color. Okay. 
And that's actually probably the biggest part of my job at Amazonia is taking care of the crickets that we raise there uh, to feed the frogs and uh, the birds and the toads. The monkeys even eat the crickets. And what do you do with the crickets? How do you take care of them? Well, we have two uh, great big 100-gallon, 150-gallon aquariums. And we have a cricket hatchery. Um, the zoo buys a certain number a week, and then we have it set up so the crickets will lay eggs, and then we raise um, small crickets, which are called pinheads and quarter inches. And that's the food stock for the whole food chain. The fish love these things. And as do all the other animals. And it, uh, I'll tell you, you know, you don't really think about, I mean, most of the time you only see one cricket at a time. And these uh, aquariums that we have are kind of like one of those fear factor types of things. Now, I'd never actually, before this, had handled any bugs or had done anything with any insects of any sort. And um, I was kind of surprised it didn't really spook me more than it did. Are you what are you sort of dipping your hand in or dipping well, something you have, in? You have to clean the things every day, and you'd be surprised how much poop is generated. Really, cricket poop by crickets. Right? No kidding. It's like concrete. You literally have to take razor blades and scrape off the bottom of the aquarium. Oh, see, we've kept a few crickets when uh, we raised starlings. Yeah. Not too exotic, but um, I, we never had that many that that was an issue. Yeah, it. Uh, I mean, we we figure the amount of crickets that we raise saves the zoo about fifty thousand dollars a year. It's a fairly complicated type of thing, and in fact, uh, that's one of the main things the volunteers have to learn. That's kind of the first thing doing this. And in fact, I've actually even made like a training video um, because it actually has kind of a monster movie charm to it. We have, you know, an egg carton. Things, that, that's kind of what you use as the strata to raise them on. And, um, you know, there's 50,000, 60,000 of these. Oh, my. So this isn't really a glamorous job all the way around that you're doing. Well, they keep it in the back room. Yeah. 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 Now, the, the frogs, uh, the last thing about the frogs, I guess, is um, I'm trying to think at an exhibit like this, the frogs are so tiny they'd be hard to see. Is there a special enclosure or something for them? We have a thing that's called... Uh, Dr. Brazil's lab, where we have aquariums and you can actually see uh, dark frogs up close. They are up in the forest, but I've only ever seen them a couple times. Oh. And in fact, um, there's a stairway that goes from the aquarium area. And the aquariums adjoin the rainforest, too. It's a two level exhibit, the lower level. Aquarium and see them laterally, but then you can walk up into the rainforest and look down into the aquarium too. Uh, on the stairs that go up there, there's sort of a, an area that that apparently there's all kinds of frogs in there too. You know, it's, it looks like it's kind of a little garden area, but there's lots of little frogs in there. And the only way you can tell is you can hear them, but I I've only ever seen them once. But tell me your tiger story. Is it a tiger or a jaguar or? Oh, that's uh, <laughs> um, they like to familiarize you with all the other activities at the zoo too. They have a very nice training program, and um, so they took us over to the lion and tiger exhibit at uh, at the national zoo, and uh, you know they have a very active breeding program, and we were right back there where they feed the animals, and there was a juvenile tiger. Um, he was born at the zoo, and he was about to, within a month of moving to another zoo, because a juvenile tiger weighs about five or 600 pounds. Oh, good grief. So how, how old would you say this thing was? Oh, he was maybe a year and a half, two years old. Oh, okay. That's, that's a big guy, all right. Right. Because they grow fast. And, you know, and, and uh, this, uh, you know, just like my cat Henry, how cats kind of like to hunker down. He's kind of hunkered down. 
and the keeper was talking about all this stuff that he kept. And while she was talking, suddenly this this cat leapt at the enclosure and the claws were going through the cage and the fangs were out. It was roaring. It was so fast, it wasn't scary. I mean, it was literally in the blink of an eye. This cat had gone from what looked like it was dozing to full attack mode. Now, the keeper didn't even bat an eye at all. I mean, she was just about to to get my uh, attention. And, uh, man, it was just frightening. I've been, I've been surprised by wild animals, you know, native animals here that do that. I'm just thinking of raccoons that... Uh, couple times I've trapped raccoons to get them out of our yard in a, in a live trap so that they, they wouldn't eat our ducks. And I take them somewhere else and uh, open the cage and I expect them just to kind of lumber away. And like in the blink of an eye, you hear a snarl and they are just gone. Right. So I, I can't even imagine, you know, seeing a tiger do that. And, and we're talking to the keeper, we had a discussion. You know, there are people in this country, you're talking about exotic pets. There are people in this more people in the United States keep tigers than there are tigers in most of the Eurasian landmass. There's anywhere between five and 10,000 people that are keeping tigers in their home or farm. Good grief. And that's such a crazy idea. Yeah, so the, the, there's like 10,000 tigers in this country? Yeah. I can't even imagine having a tiger as a pet. Oh, I can't either. I, I think the problem is people, I, I think... You know, can you can get these things pretty inexpensively as uh, cubs, but like I said, in the course of a year, they'll grow to five or six hundred pounds. Now, can you imagine sitting at your word processor or your your computer, um, you know, typing away and have a tiger hop up on your lap and and try and be able to do your work? <laughs> that is a nuisance. I don't know what those people are thinking of. Well, it, what were they thinking? Well, I thought my wife had a good line, which was, I said, you know, keeping a tiger like that's more dangerous than just leaving a cocked, loaded gun on your uh, dining room table. And my wife responded, so, well, maybe those are the same people that keep the tigers because they need that cocked, loaded gun. Yeah, I think so. Man, and... Um, They're not good pets. Well, plus... Like, the, as the keeper at Amazonia said, that... The, the the big cats there said they like me as much as they like anyone. She said, but I have no doubt where I'd walk in there with them, they'd kill me. Yeah, yeah. And, that, and she also said that Siegfried and Roy, who said they're probably the most knowledgeable people in the world in handling wild animals, and look what happened. That's right. That's exactly right. So what in Amazonia, we're, we're kind of running short on time now, believe it or not, um, what would you say is the most difficult animal to work with there? Um, probably the seven-foot arapaimas. They're, yeah. uh, they're a uh, uh, a great big beautiful fish. They're an air-breathing fish, um, and they're really smart. And when you feed them, um, they uh, they can shoot water about ten feet, and um, that and by the way, this is an example of another thing with an exotic fish. When Amazonia opened 15 years ago, these things started off as six-inch long fish. They're now seven feet long. So you don't want one in your aquarium. Yeah, they're they out they you know they just bought a couple new arapaimas and they outgrew what's called a Titan tank, which is I think a 300 gallon tank. So not a good bath not a good bathtub fish either. Yeah, they're not a good, well, if you, you'd have to have a really big bathtub, Bob. Yeah, well, I do. Uh, <laughs> and you wouldn't be able to use it for baths anymore. But um, it's not that they're a particularly mean fish, but they they don't really brook any nonsense. And they're sort of the top predator there. So feeding them is a very complicated process. So you have to feed them at one end. And then you go to the other end of the big pool and put... Essentially, this, we have these kind of very long uh, plastic PCV pipes down at the bottom to feed the fish below there. So, they, you know, the arapaimas don't vacuum up everything so that the fish on the bottom can get some of the goodies, too. And uh, the arapaima don't really like that. And 
So you'll be standing there putting the stuff down there, and these things will hit this tube. I mean, it's enough to knock you over, and you're sort of standing on the edge of this pool anyway. You don't really want to fall in. <laughs> no. Now you wanted you wanted to mention that there's a webcam at the at the right. uh, Amazonia. So what? The uh, the National Zoo has a website, and it's obviously you know National Zoo one word dot si at Smithsonian Institution dot edu, and then you just on the site just it says where Amazonia is, and they have a webcam, and you can see the fish, the arapaimas and the arowanas swimming around and. It's uh, quite spectacular there. Well, very cool. Well, thank you so much, Brian. We've been talking to Brian O'Malley, who lives in Arlington, Virginia, and volunteers at the Amazonia exhibit at the National Zoo in Washington, D.C. And I guess your message for people, perhaps, is volunteer at your local zoo. As opposed to buying exotic fish or, or creatures and getting them out of the wild. That's exactly right. All right. Well, thanks, Brian. Well, it's my pleasure, Bob. You're a great author. Oh, thank you. That was great, Brian. Thank you so much for doing that interview. You just make everything sound so exciting. Gosh, uh, you're going to make everybody want to be a volunteer at a zoo. Gosh, maybe I should be a volunteer. What do you think, sweetie? A volunteer at the zoo? Yeah. Um, I think you are already a volunteer at the zoo, at the Tart Zoo. Oh, yeah. I yeah, didn't think we, about that. We, uh, we have, have to remind our listeners we have about 40 animals here, mostly 45, birds. 45, yeah. And I think I'm going to get Brian back on the phone and get him over here to do some he volunteer. He can do volunteer here. That's exactly right. Speaking of volunteer, we would like our listeners to volunteer to be our guests on the show. So just uh, if you have an exotic pet of some kind, a turtle, a tarantula, a snake, snake, a cockatoo, cockatiel, whatever whatever you have. Tell us about it. Yeah, we want to hear about it. So just send us an email at bob at petliferadio.com and who knows, you might be the next guest on What Were You Thinking? We can't wait. So uh, thanks to everybody. Thanks to our listeners. Thanks Thank to, you, Brian. Thanks to our very mysterious producers that no man or woman has ever seen. And uh, want to say goodbye to everybody. Bye-bye. Thinking about buying a monkey? How about a ferret or a skunk? Then check out the show that will answer the burning questions, where do you get them? What do you feed them? How do you take care of them? And most of all, what were you thinking? With exotic pet expert and author Bob Tart, every week on demand from PetLifeRadio.com.